I said to the police, you have to capture him very, very soon because he's going to relapse, he's going to do it again. I thought at that moment they are violated and murdered. The police has all the answers. The question remains, why didn't they arrest him? Marcinelle, a grim suburb of the industrial town of Charlois in the south of Belgium, where on the 15th of August 1996, the dramatic rescue of two young girls was caught on camera. Letitia Delhez had been held captive for six days. Sabine Dardenne for more than two months. I remember that around uh, seven or eight o'clock we got these phone calls, these messages that uh, something terrible had happened or something very wonderful had, had happened in Charleroi. Two girls had been released. We discovered there that uh, these children had been locked up in, in, a, in, a, in a very small cage. Something like this in our beautiful small country, Belgium, is incredible. It was the start of a period of months, maybe even years, that this was the only story we worked on. Kidnap, rape, murder. The events of the following months would involve six families and shake a nation to its core. It was a tragedy that would gather momentum and spark national outrage over rumours of conspiracy and corruption in the highest levels of the Belgian judicial system. A tragedy that we now know could have been avoided. And at its centre, an evil psychopath, Marc Dutroux. <laughs> Grassoloni, a rural suburb of Liège, home of two eight-year-old girls, Julie and Melissa. On June 24th, 1995, a hot summer's day, the two friends went to wave at the traffic from the flyover near their family home. They never returned. Two girls together disappear at the same moment. You look at England, Holly and Jessica, it came as a shock. Everybody, that this is very unusual. Message to Julie. Julie, my chérie, je ne t'ai pas dit assez, je t'aime. Distraught and fearing the worst, the parents of the two girls sent out an appeal. Ton papa, ta maman, Maxime et toute la famille. Melissa, ma toute petite fille, mon trésor, si tu pouvais m'entendre, je veux que tu saches que ta maman, ton papa, ton frère, toute la famille, tous nos amis ne font plus qu'une seule chose depuis que tu es parti, te chercher et t'attendre. On pense tous très très fort à toi. Whenever in the United Kingdom young children went missing, there would be a national outcry from the very beginning and there would have been a very large police investigation mounted. Now, somehow in Belgium, none of that seemed to have taken place and it just went quiet very quickly. After three weeks, the police were drawing a blank. The parents, desperate to know what had happened to their daughters, hired a local detective, who in turn hired a criminal profiler to try to help with the case. The first thing I asked was, bring me there where the children had been seen for the last time, because I have to see the area. I have to make a geographical mapping in my head. Well, this is Grasolonia. That's the area where the children lived. And the most probable scenario is that they came from that road. 
and then walked towards the bridge that crosses the highway, the motorway, where they used to wave at cars. After visiting the location of Julie and Melissa's disappearance, Karine started to put together a profile of the offender. Methodical, unemployed, probably married with children. He took a very high, high risk. This means that he is not a debutant. And with a criminal record for abduction, uh, sequestration and torture, maybe there are five or six people who fit already this small profile. Anyone with a criminal record for a similar crime should have been a prime suspect. Mark de True, imprisoned for the rape and abduction of five women, had been released just three years earlier. Age 38, de True was an unemployed electrician who lived in Charlois with his second wife and two children. He fitted Karine's profile with uncanny accuracy. Karine gave the profile to the police, but despite his previous conviction, de True was never taken in for questioning. The first of a series of police blunders that would define the case. I said to the police, you have to, uh, to capture him very, very soon because he's going to relapse, he's going to do it again. But they just did not listen. Five weeks later, in the opposite end of the country, teenagers Anne Marshall and Effie Lambrix took a holiday with a group of friends in the seaside resort of Blankenburg in the north of Belgium. We had some discussion about it because I didn't want her to go alone without parents. She was 17. And uh, my wife, Betty, she said, let her go. She will be uh, in 18 in, in a few months. And so, yes, uh, they were right. You have to, to let uh, your children go, certainly for a holiday with friends. One night during the holiday, Anne and Effie went to a hypnotist show. A member of the audience filmed the girls on stage. These images would be the last that Paul Marshall would see of his daughter. Later, they were caught on security cameras leaving the casino to catch a tram. They never arrived back at their holiday home. One of the friends phoned us on Wednesday evening and he said, um, Anne and Evia were going to a show in Blankenbergen and uh, it was a Tuesday evening, but they are not returned. I said, you had to go to the police. And he said, we were by police, but they don't believe us. They laugh with us. They say that it's not serious, that uh, Anne is 17 and Evie is 19, and that they will be somewhere with friends, boyfriends or something like that, that they are doing a, a sort of adventure. I said, no, it's not possible. And uh, we were very worried. And at that moment, uh, I thought uh, they are murdered. Uh, they are, I thought at that moment, they are violated and murdered. Like the parents of Julie and Melissa, the Marshalls felt let down by the police investigation. Frustrated, they started their own poster campaign to look for the girls, searching over Europe and across the world. But despite the search efforts, no trace of Anne and Effie were found and no connection was made between their disappearance and that of Julie and Melissa. Nor that there may be a serial kidnapper on the loose. It would be obvious to anyone they'd been abducted. I mean, it could not be that these girls had just got lost uh, and strolled off and, and died somewhere, especially when invariably they went in pairs. It just looked as though that someone was very active. Nobody in Belgium inside the police force was so intelligent to think that if two girls are kidnapped in June and two others are kidnapped in August, it might be the same criminal. It's, that's, already that seemed to be too complicated for them.
August 1995, Belgium. In the past two months, four girls had vanished from opposite ends of the country. The local police departments investigating the disappearances of Anne and Effia and Julian Melissa were getting nowhere. They had even failed to make a connection between the cases that would point towards a serial kidnapper. But 100 miles away in Cholois, another department within the police force, the National Gendarmerie, had received some disturbing information pointing them to a prime suspect. Three weeks after Anne and Effia's disappearance, a letter had arrived from a woman saying that she had seen two teenage girls being held in her son's house. The letter was signed Janine Lawrence, the mother of Mark Dutroux. She wrote a letter to the police to say that she knew that two girls are kept by Dutroux in house. Two girls of 16 and 18, she said. Anne was 17, Avia 19. Police didn't do anything about it. Division in the Belgian police force into local police and national gendarmerie bred a mutual distrust and dislike between the two departments. In fact, for the last two years, the gendarmes in Cholwa had been collating a confidential file with other evidence pointing to Mark Dutroux as a suspect. But they made no effort to share this information or the contents of Janine Lauren's letter with the local police who were investigating the disappearance of the missing girls. Everybody knew that they were in some kind of uh, competition. And if you have a competition in sports, that means one team wants to make a goal and the other wants to make a goal too. What we see here is that there is a competition between two police forces. One of its is uh, the Gendarmerie. In 1993, the Chalois Gendarmerie had been contacted by one of Marc Dutroux's tenants, Claude Thiron, who said he had some disturbing information about his landlord. I first met him in 1992. We were in the car. There were two girls walking along. I think they'd been drinking. One of them was staggering. And he parked the car at the side of the road and then he suggested kidnapping the two girls. You had to creep up behind them, put your hand over their mouth and put them into the car, close the door, the child lock was on so they couldn't get out, and if need be, knock them out. But I refused point blank. I said to Mark Dutroux, you're mad, I'm not doing that. He took me straight home and I went straight to the gendarmerie within the hour. The gendarmes persuaded Thiroux to become their informant. Over the next two years, he reported that Dutroux was planning to kidnap girls to sell them into a prostitute network. When he was out in his car or van or whatever, when he saw any little girls, he used to say, oh, they're young and fresh, that would sell well. But the police knew this, they knew everything. Three other informants also came forward, confirming Tiro's testimony. But remarkably, in the summer of 1995, when young girls started to vanish, the gendarmes didn't take to true in for questioning, a decision that would have tragic consequences. Born in Ixelles in 1956, Dutroux grew up in Aubay, a small village near Charlois in Belgium. The oldest son of Janine and Victor Dutroux, who had a reputation for harsh treatment of their five children. There have been interventions of the local police several times in that, that house, in that family. There are neighbors who already at that moment, in the, the moment itself, uh, had their testimonies about this kid being beaten and beaten all the time. At the age of just five, the true was forced to take a one-hour walk and then a train journey to school every day on his own. He's raised as a... with only negative feelings, no emotion. In fact, the only message he gets from his parents is we never wanted you to uh, go to hell. That's, you, you're worthless. That, that's the idea in which he, 
He started.